Hello, fourth graders. Welcome to Maniac McGee, chapters 37 and 38. Thus began a series of heroic feats by Maniac McGee. At 20 paces, he hit a telephone pole with a stone 61 times in a row. When the once-a-week freight train hit Elm Street, he started running from the Oriole Street dead end on one rail and beat the train to the park, no sweat. He took off his sneaks and socks and walked, nonchalant as you please, through the rat-infested dump at the foot of Rako Hill. The mysterious hole down by the creek, the one you would never reach into, even if you dropped your most valuable possession into it, he stuck his hand in, his arm in, all the way to the elbow, kept it there for the longest 60 seconds on record, and pulled it out, dirty but still full of fingers. He climbed the fence at the American bison pen at the zoo. He had suggested this feat himself. Everyone else scoffing. And while the mother looked on, kissed the baby buffalo. So it went through February and March of that year, a feat a week. To much of the town hearing about these things, it was simply a case of the legend adding to itself, doing what legends do. To Russell and Piper McNabb, it was a case of boosting their importance ever higher in the eyes of the other kids. Was it not at the brothers' direction that Maniac McGee performed these deeds? After all, who is more amazing, the lion or the tamer? As for Maniac, he understood early on that he was being used for the greater glory of Piper and Russell. He also understood that without him, they would not be going to school every day. For the McNabs, there was nothing free about public education. A tuition had to be paid. Every week, Maniac paid it. And besides, he loved to meet the challenges they cooked up for him. And then one day, they gave him the most perilous challenge of all. They dared him to go into the East End. Chapter 38. The witnesses, there were twice 15 this time, went with him as far as Hector Street. They halted at the curb. He crossed the street and went on alone. Piper megaphoned after him. Maniac, come back. We was just kidding. You don't have to. Maniac just waved and went on. He knew he should be feeling afraid of these East Enders, these so-called black people. But he wasn't. It was himself he was afraid of, of any afraid of any trouble he might cause just by being there. It was a day of the worms, that first almost warm after the rainy night day in April when you bolt from your house to find yourself in a world of worms. They were as numerous here as in the East End as they had been in the West. The sidewalks, the streets, the very places where they don't belong. Forlorn, marooned on concrete and asphalt, no place to burrow, April's orphans. Once when he was little in Hollidaysburg, he had gone along with his toy wheelbarrow, carefully lifting them with the borrowed kitchen fork until the barrel was full then dumped them into Mr. Snavely's compost pile. And sure as the worms followed the rain, the kids followed the worms. West End, East End, they had poured from their houses onto the cool, damp sidewalks. And if they gave the worms any notice, it was only when they squashed one underfoot. And so, as Maniac moved through the East End, he felt the presence of not one but two populations, both occupying the same territory, yet each unmindful of the other one yelping and playing and chasing and laughing, the other lost and silent and dying by the millions. Yo, fish belly. Maniac snapped too. He glanced at a street sign. He was four blocks from Hector, deep in the east. Mars Bar came dip-jiving toward him, taller than before, bigger, but still scowling. Hey, fish, thought you was gone. Maniac turned to face him fully. Mars Bar did not stop until he was inside Maniac's phone booth of space, inches from his face. They locked eyes, levelly. Maniac thinking, I must be growing too. He said, I'm back. The scowl fearsome. Maybe nobody told you. I'm badder than ever. I'm getting badder every day. I'm almost afraid to wake up in the morning. He leaned in closer. Because of how bad I might have got overnight. Maniac smiled, nodded. Yeah, you're bad, Mars. 
He gave a little sniff. His smile went a little smirky. And, and I'm getting so bad myself, I think I must be half black. Mars's eyes bulged. He backed off, the scowl collapsed, and he howled with laughter. His buddies, who were hanging back, stared dumbly. As Mars unwound from his laughing fit, he studied Maniac up and down, aware, too, that Maniac was studying him. When he could speak again, he said, Still them raggedy clothes, huh, fish? He lifted one foot, posed. I seen you looking. Like them kicks? Just got them. Maniac nodded. Nice. They were more than nice. They were beautiful. The best, yes, the baddest, sneaks he had ever seen. Way better than anything Grayson could have afforded. I forgot to tell you something else, too, Fish. What's that? I'm fast. I mean, I'm faster. I've been working out. Got my boss new kicks. He sprinted in place, arms and legs pistoning to a blur. He stopped. He jabbed a finger at Maniac's nose, pressed it flattening the soft end of it. See? Guess you were right. Now at least you got a black nose. He laughed. They both laughed. Everybody laughed. Then Mars turned scowly again, saying, But you ain't black enough or bad enough to beat the Mars man. We are gonna race, bud. The race was set up on Plum Street, the long, level block between Ash and Jackson. By the time they were ready, half the kids in the East End were there, from the tiniest pipsqueaks to high schoolers. The little kids ran races of their own from curb to curb. The bigger kids shouldered blasters and dug into their jeans for coins to bet with. For the first time since last fall, mothers opened windows and leaned out from second stories. Traffic was detoured from both ends of the block. No one could find string for the finish, so a second story mother dropped down a spool of bright pink thread. Another problem was the start. First, they had to find chalk to draw the starting line. When they did, nobody could seem to draw it straight. The result? A stack of starting lines creeping up the street till someone brought out a yardstick and did it right. The next problem came when the starter, Bump Gilliam, who was also Mars's best pal, called, Get ready! And someone in the crowd yelled, That ain't what you say. You say, Take your mark. Well, everybody jumped into it then. There was shoving and jawing and almost a fist fight over the proper way to start a race. Finally, there was a compromise, and Bump called, Get ready on your mark! At which point, someone else called, Go, Mars! And Bump turned and snarled, Shut up! When the starter starts, there's no noise. So naturally, someone else called, Smoke em, Mars! And then came, Waste em, Mars! And do the honk, barman! and they might still be calling to this day had not a single voice separated itself from the others. Burn em, McGee! It was hands down, laughing and pointing from his perch on the roof of a car. Bump jumped into the let-up. Get set! Go! And at long last, mossy from their weight at the starting line, they went. Even as the race began, even after it began, Maniac wasn't sure how to run it. Naturally, he wanted to win, or at least to do his best. All his instincts told him that. But there were other considerations. Whom he was racing against, and where, and what the consequences might be if he won. These were heavy considerations, heavy enough to slow him down, until the hysterical crowd and the sight of Mars Bar's sneaker bottoms and the boiling of his own blood ignited his afterburners. And before you could say, Burn him, McGee, he was ahead, the pink thread bobbing in his sights. But he never saw his body break the thread. He only he saw only the face of Mars Bar, straining, gasping, unbelieving, losing. They went crazy. They went wild. They went totally bananas. You see him? He turned around. He ran backwards. He did it backwards. He beat him going backwards. Mars Bar tried. He shoved bump. You started too fast. I wasn't ready. He shoved the thread holders. You moved it up so he could win. I was gaining on him. He shoved Maniac. You bumped me. You got a false start. You cheated. But his protests drowned in the pandemonium. Why did I do it? Was all Maniac could think. He hadn't even realized it till he crossed the line. And he regretted it instantly. Wasn't it enough just to win? Did he have to disgrace his opponent as well? Had he done it deliberately? 
to pay Mars Bar back for all his nastiness? To show him up and shut him up once and for all? His only recollection was a feeling of sheer joyful exuberance, himself in celebration, shouting Amen in the Bethany Church, bashing John McNabb's fastballs out of sight, dancing the polka with Gracie. Maybe it was that simple. After all, who asks why otters toboggan down mud banks? But that didn't make it any less stupid or rotten a thing to do. The hatred in Mars Bar's eyes was no longer for a white kid in the East End. It was for Jeffrey McGee, period. The crowd surged with him as he made his way westward. It wasn't clear whether they were glad or not that he had won, only that they had seen something to set them off. They jostled and jammed and high-fived and jived. For everyone who called him White Lightning, two more challenged him to race. Right here, baby, you and me, see who's going to turn his back on who. Maniac kept moving, embarrassed, wishing he could just break out and sprint for the West End, wishing he could duck into the Beals' house and be sanctuary there and not fear reprisals on them. And just about then, miraculously, two little hands were worming into his, two familiar voices squealing, Maniac! Maniac! Hester and Lester. He snatched them up, one in each arm. He was on Sycamore Street. There was the house, the door opening. Amanda, Mrs. Beale, smiling to beat the band. And that's that for today. Bye.